Welcome everyone to our webinar series, Academic Integrity, Urgent and Emerging Topics. We'd like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, the Kani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. And the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. A little bit of housekeeping before we get into our webinar today. As participants, you'll be muted during the session and your cameras will be turned off. That's because the session will be recorded and the recording link will be shared with all registrants after the session today. Your name may appear in the participant list during the recording, just so that you know, and the chat is not captured during the recording. Um, and also wanted to let you know that today's session is part of our year-long Academic Integrity webinar series through the Taylor Institute of Teaching and Learning. And I wanted to give a shout out to our next webinar happening in October, October 9th, with Dr. Cecilia Parnther on creating a culture of equity in academic integrity, best practices for teaching and learning. Dr. Parnther will talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion issues as they relate to academic integrity. Uh, and with that, we'll turn it over to, uh, to Jamie to get started with today's slides for our session today. Terrific. Well, welcome friends to our webinar today of understanding the landscape of counterfeit credentials and university admissions fraud, degrees of deceit. I'm joined today by Jamie Carmichael from Carleton University. Terrific. Thanks. In 2019, Operation Varsity Blues, the college admissions scandals in the United States brought the issue of admissions fraud to the foreground with extensive media coverage, not only in the US, but also across the globe. Over the next hour or so, uh, we're gonna take you on a journey to understand what university and college admissions fraud is, how it happens, and what to look out for if your work involves handling admissions files at any stage of the process. We'll offer some evidence-based background and also give you some concrete and practical tips about how to protect the integrity of your programs and your school. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Jamie Carmichael. I'm the Associate Registrar for Scheduling and Systems at Carleton University. Um, I'm also a graduate student as well. So I'm, my, my specific research is on contract cheating and machine learning. And what I'm interested in the uh, fraudulent uh, credential space is really looking at technology. So what are our present gaps uh, in our process now? And what are the opportunities to close those gaps? Great, thanks, Jamie. Uh, and I'm Sarah Lane Eaton. My research program is on academic integrity and educational research. I've been uh, researching various topics related to these broad umbrella areas for a number of years now. Uh, and this topic definitely falls under applied ethics in educational context and institutional integrity. And we're excited to, uh, to be here with you today. And I'd also like to mention that you can post your questions in the Zoom chat box throughout the session. And um, we'll also have a Q&A session at the end. Terrific. By the end of our time together today, uh, we expect that you'll come away with an understanding of some of the foundational concepts related to admission fraud. Uh, that includes developing your awareness about some of the industry models that exist. And believe me, this is an industry. Um, Alan Zell and John Baer estimated um, in 2005, 15 years ago, that the industry was worth a billion dollars US at that time. Uh, and they wrote one of the most prominent books on in this area. Um, and so we have no data on how much the industry has grown since then, but we know that it remains alive and active. Um, so we'll be talking about the industry and then we'll wrap up with some practical strategies for those who work in higher education um, and including admissions in any ways from administrative staff to faculties who sit on admissions committees uh, and others uh, who are involved in the admissions process. Uh, because we want to help prevent those with fake or fraudulent credentials from entering our programs and our schools. So we can go to the next slide. So let's dive right in. Um, we're going to start by looking at some of the key concepts that underpin the work. And those are sort of uh, alliteration aside, uh, accreditation, agents and assessment. So accreditation is a fairly poorly understood concept outside of higher education particularly for those who don't work in the quality assurance aspect of higher education. Some companies, shady companies, will market um, fraudulent degrees or credentials by using phrases such as authorized, incorporated, or registered. Um, but none of those terms mean 
and anything close to what the accredited programs are that are officially approved through government bodies, such as provincial ministries. So some of the shady uh, companies will use these terms to dupe um, people or customers into thinking that uh, the programs that they're selling or the degrees they're selling or the pieces of paper are actually legitimate. So there's sort of two kinds of customers, if you will, those who know that what they're buying is fake and others who are duped into thinking that they're buying something legitimate, such as attending a school that doesn't exist, for example. So we always like to say that the rule of buyer beware um, applies. And then we need to talk about agents. And I'll start by saying that there are many legitimate educational agents out there, um, but there are also many unscrupulous ones. It's a completely unregulated industry uh, or profession, and anybody can call themselves an educational agent without any credentials themselves. So it's important for students and parents to ask themselves questions about the educational agents that they're working with um, and not just necessarily rely on a sales pitch or those kinds of things, um, because often um, they'll say that they will help the, the student and uh, in many ways what they'll sell is not actually um, credible in any way. And then we'll talk about credential assessment. So there are legitimate um, bodies that assess educational credentials, for example, when people have earned their credentials in another country. And one of those examples, for example, uh, is uh, in Alberta, the um, International Qualifications Assessment uh, Bodies, we call it EQUAS for short, and I'll actually put the uh, website here in the chat box as an example of a legitimate um, service that will offer accreditation. But there are also shady services that will sell fake degrees and fake content transcripts, and then subsequently sell a fake certificate of credential assessment. So you can start to see the different layers that this industry has and that how they have all of the angles covered in terms of propagating assessment fraud uh, at every step of the process. So that we can move on to the next slide. Um, and we can talk more about the sort of the fake and fraudulent documents that can enter into a fraudulent admissions application so for example, there are illegitimate uh, degrees. There's a few different kinds and it's important to differentiate between them. There are degrees from legitimate schools, such as the University of Calgary or Carleton University, where we're joining you from today, that have been replicated and tampered with to include the name of somebody who's purchased a fake degree from the internet rather than is a legitimate graduate. There are also some legitimate schools that have programs that have not yet received full accreditation. In some cases, those programs may have real registrants, but the people who are registered, the students may not understand that the program that they're taking uh, has not fully approved official recognition, uh, or it's not been fully approved yet. And then in cases like this, some schools, not all schools, but some schools may make uh, no explicit claims about the accreditation, uh, may not disclose to all registrants that a particular program is awaiting approval, but hasn't yet received it. That's a form of deception for those who are registered because they might trust the overall name brand of a school. And then finally, there are um, completely unaccredited schools that try to fool prospective students into thinking that they're paying for legitimate programs when in fact the programs have not been approved by any official accreditation agency. And some examples of these kinds of schools might include shady business schools or some alternative health institutes. Um, in some cases, students pay for and attend classes thinking they're paying for a legitimate educational experience, but the piece of paper they receive at the end is not recognized as legitimate. It's nothing more than a certificate of completion. Uh, and there are some so-called or alleged institutions that will use uh, this kind of program, unaccredited program, to get students to apply for student loans. Um, both here and in the United States, it seems to be from what we've been able to determine more prevalent in the United States than in Canada. Um, and then the school will get the so-called tuition that students have um, you know, received money for for the loans. The students are stuck with a big loan. The school has its so-called tuition. Uh, and then what the students are getting at the end is not actually an accredited um, program at all. And then there's completely fake institutions that don't exist at all anywhere. They offer no programs, have no campuses, and effectively just sell fake credentials from a non-existent school or entity. Um, and we've already talked about the evaluation services, so we'll move on to the next slide to talk a little bit about uh, reference letters. And there's two kinds of reference letters uh, to watch out for. One are fake letters written by people who don't exist, 
and the other are fraudulent letters that are submitted uh, with a person's name, uh, possibly signature, but the individual doesn't know that their name or credentials have been used in a reference letter. And similar to reference letters, we also have transcripts, a couple of different kinds of bogus transcripts to watch out for. One are real transcripts that have been tampered with. Uh, in these cases, the grades are often altered to reflect a higher grade than that which was um, legitimately earned. And then there are also fake transcripts that have been purchased, mainly through online sources, that show grades for courses that the alleged student never took. So these are some of the basics, just to kind of get us started. And now I'm going to hand it over to Jamie to dig a bit deeper. So take it away, Jamie. Perfect. Okay, so thank you, Sarah. Uh, so Sarah has provided the conceptual foundation to frame the problem. Uh, now we will examine the landscapes from a business perspective. So focusing on marketing, fake document generators, legitimate schools who, whose degrees have been tampered to legitimate schools with uncredited programs. So we call this slide from Pinterest to Doctor Who. So the landscape of fake credentials has obviously uh, changed drastically with the internet. Um, but what's really added fuel to this fire is the sharing and the platform economies. Um, so, so with the sharing economy, uh, it's really a peer-to-peer -peer model and the rules governing this economic exchange could be you know, sharing for the sake of sharing, it could be to buy a specific product or a service. So if we think of all of those spaces that we can share information on, so we have Facebook, YouTube to Twitter, Think about what a great vehicle this is uh, for your business. So Pinterest, uh, which I personally believed was for uh, crafts and Martha Stewart type things, is also, as it turns out, a fantastic place to promote your fake degree business. Um, so we'll show you a few examples from our own institutions that were posted on Pinterest in the subsequent uh, slides. Now, all of this sharing takes place on a digital platform. So we know very successful businesses are built around platforms. Uh, so we have Amazon that is a marketplace where you can buy products. We also have services like Uber, uh, you know, should you need a, a, a ride. So this business, these types of businesses le leveraged on platforms are accessible and they're global. I read an article recently that said really platforms are like the new factory because I mean, uh, it is at the heart of a lot of our businesses these days and on these plat pl platforms they're also it's an opportunity for the user uh, to interact right so it's also about an experience you can customize and you can create um, so with respect to that, so there are these things called degree generators, which you can, uh, you know, create a degree in seconds. So I like this reference to Doctor Who because I work in the scheduling office. And often when people ask me what I do for a living, because, you know, the associate register thing, huh? So I tell them that, you know, I control space and time. So if I was to do this, which I haven't done, I think that I, I would create something that says um, Doctor Who. But really, you can put whatever you want on these things, obviously, and, it, and it's meant to be fun. But obviously, we can see there's some nefarious underpinnings in this. So let's. My slides are sticking just a bit. There we go. Voila. Okay, so here's here's some samples, and this is taken from screen shares on, on Pinterest of our own institution. So this is obviously promoting a service, fakeadiploma.com. This is one example. There's many. So I would definitely encourage you to check it out for your own institution. So when you do look at these types of services, there's a few attributes that they have in common that I thought would be interesting to note. So, you know, they all speak to a guarantee or a promise uh, about their quality. They talk about their years of service, or in some cases, which is interesting, they even mention that other services are unethical and that's a way that they can differentiate themselves. So most, of course, have reviews, uh, testimonials, and you know, uh, five-star ratings like we would see with other, with other products. So on these particular sites, you can 
order high school diplomas, undergraduate to graduate degrees. So how it works is the higher the education level, typically the higher the cost. So for most sites, they seem to break down the cost by country and the price seems to, incre to increase if you, if you want a replication degree versus a fake one. So a fake degree may go for say $150, but 200 for the replicated version. So they use a template to closely match the degree, but the replicated version usually comes from a scan copy that the, that the client would provide. Now, there are all sorts of special discounts for this type of thing and coupons. So with COVID, for example, there's a 15% uh, discount or you can bundle things. So you can get a fake transcript and a fake degree for a lower price, or you can get multiple degrees um, different year levels and that also it's similar to your internet and cable provider right you can you can bundle the offerings as well so some sites also go into specifics about the paper uh, like parchment paper or how the seal specifically is is used they talk about why you would purchase um, so it's everything from you know birthday gifts to you have a, a uh, a damaged degree to pretend I went to college. So they definitely explain or they definitely, I think, clearly uh, iterate the value they provide and how they position themselves in the market. The shipping is pretty fast from what I've seen. So some sites say uh, specifically that they ship three days after the uh, initial design, others it's eight to 12, and most of them have a rush service. So you can either do that, you can get the rush service for 48 hours or 24 hours. Um, it's a pretty straightforward process really. So you, it's a couple of clicks, you fill out a form, you specify what you want, tick, 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 you review, you pay, you note your, chip, your shipping. It's just like purchasing a pair of shoes, really, right? So, and also throughout this whole process, um, they have live support, uh, they can help you, uh, all sorts of things like that. And then they also talk about the, 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 the privacy of your data. Now, of course, we talked about transcripts as well. Um, so transcripts, just a little bit of a, a, a price comparison. So they can go for $150 US for the fake one uh, to 400 for the replicated version. Uh, certificates, Sarah had mentioned like language proficiency assessments. So they can range from $150 to 225 US. So now let's, let's, let's frame this. Um, so say we have an international student, uh, they would pay $40,000 uh, a year, and let's say it's a four-year program, that's $160,000 when you can, uh, you know, you can go to a service like that, get your, de get your, your degree for $150, no work, time, money, and you can enter into the workforce. So just to kind of frame the problem that we're dealing with. So I think most of the things that we've been talking about so far to, to, to provide a sense of the landscape, um, they're really transparent about the service that they provide, right? So they're not pretending, but they acknowledge that they are producing fake documents, right? But there are some other services that are not as forthcoming. So um, as Sarah noted, fake degrees can also come to the, under the guise of legitimate schools providing degrees with some academic content. Some students may be duped into believing these are actually real. Um, and they have a complete absence of quality programming, exams and grades. So uh, our admissions folks at Carleton refer to these sorts of schools as strip mall schools. So we're gonna get more into that under the impact section. Um, but under landscape, I wanted to uh, really highlight two particular scams that seem to be trending. Uh, for you to be aware about. So we have scholarship associations. Uh, they tell a student that they have received a scholarship to let's say Carleton, but the student actually never even applied to Carleton. So the scholarship offer is contingent on payment, of course, and looks authentic. It has the, you know, the Carleton logo and a formal uh, letter comes with it as well. Likewise, a similar sort of scam. So companies offering scholarships to students if they buy their services. So these services mostly involve contract cheating 
or very unethical uh, editing services. So the scholarship really isn't a scholarship. Uh, it's a reduction in price, if you will. Students just need, of course, their credit card uh, to participate. So um, another question to think about too, so uh, it also begs the question whether blackmail is also taking place. I, you know, we, we haven't really heard anything about it, particularly in Canada, but I know in the contract cheating world, so uh, it, we've definitely seen that. So students have used a service to purchase an assignment and they can be blackmailed by the company with threats that they will tell their post post-secondary institution or even their employer when they get into the work world. And then uh, lastly, sort of summarize the landscape section. So there's no laws in Canada um, against these types of websites and licenses, licenses when we talk about these uh, strip mall schools, despite obviously there's big implications for our labor market and society. All right, impact. So how do we respond to this landscape, right? So obviously we know that failure to put measures in place could attract media attention, scandals, it affects our reputation as institutions, affects our enrollment, uh, there could be legal issues, but, and, and also, you know, overall our financial uh, sustainability. So I wanted to compile uh, some best practices. So this runs the full gamut. So admissions, grades, transcripts, uh, that can be employed to circumvent cr uh, fake credentials. So some of these are used at Carleton. I'm sure they're used at your institutions as well. Others we found in articles. Uh, and uh, before I start, I just want to acknowledge uh, the admission folks at Carleton and also our uh, records manager and the registrar's office who helped, uh, helped me put together this sort of top 13 list. So let's let's kick it off. So. The first, the first uh, recommendation: use a directed or a direct transmission system for admission applications. So, I think this is a fairly uh, normative industry uh, practice, uh, but not for everyone. So, I thought it was worthwhile to mention. So, just to frame it, when students apply, their grades are electronically submitted via a portal therefore streaming both the admissions process and minimizing the potential for tampering. So in Ontario, students must submit their university application through OUYAC, so that's the Ontario University's Application Centre, and this of course removes the middleman from the process. Consider an evaluation service. So a service will evaluate a student's admission file, so they'll examine their transcript and then compare it with the actual program requirements. So an official report is sort of issued and it really gives it that stamp of authority. Uh, it might be, uh, depending on your institution, it might be more cost effective to hire a service. Uh, versus training your staff because uh, as we can tell from everything we're saying the landscape continues to evolve and change and you have to keep up with everything and, and as well you have staff that you know they move and you'll have to train and it could become quite expensive. Know the telltale signs of a fake degree. Well, first, I guess the most important thing is you you always validate using an original right not a photocopy. Uh, so what we've learned is fake degrees can either be a replication uh, from a legitimate university or college or from an entirely made up one really. Um, and you know you can do a simple uh, Google search to, to, to verify that. Does, does, the, does the degree have all the necessary components and in the right order, right? So we have the seal, the signature, the watermark, the correct language. Uh, is the signature in pen when you use a when you use a printer for the references, for example, or for the for the signatures? Double check for spelling mistakes. Um, it, you know, for for Carlton, is Carlton spelled correctly? Did you forget the e? That kind of thing. Verify the watermark by holding it up to the light. It should be transparent. Uh, look at the name, date of convocation, and cross-check all the data points for errors. So, for example, check that the correct names and signatures are in place. So, a common mistake with a fraudulent diploma will be to use the names, signatures, 
of prior or incorrect presidents and signatures. So why? Uh, this is because they are often working with a stolen diploma that might be older. They don't know uh, or really care uh, that people change over time, right? So as well, uh, it's also important to have some cultural awareness. So being aware of um, how the year example, or for example, is displayed in Arabic or um, uh, Chinese uh, as examples. So, of course, services that provide fake degrees are aware of all these tricks as well, right? We can see these, we can find these easily online, and they're definitely going to continue uh, to work towards making these bulletproof, right? So, putting my systems hat on, when I first heard about this problem, I thought, well, maybe this, maybe this process could be automated in the future using uh, computer vision. So computer vision is a subset of artificial intelligence. And I was kind of thinking, yes, like, why aren't we doing this? And that can detect the, the differences in images. So um, after talking to the, the admissions group, uh, so interna international documents, which I learned is, is, is there's really a lot of variance, right? So by program, even within the same institution. So if we wanted to create a library to detect these differences, that would be really hard to do. Uh, and also, of course, not only that, some transcripts are still being handwritten in parts of the world. So I know in, in, in some places in China. Of course, all of that to be said, there's some interesting technologies that are definitely on the horizon that, that you know, we need to watch. watch. Uh, so blockchain with respect to keeping our data safe and lots of conversations around digital secure credentials. So these secured credentials are verified and stored in a database. And then, so when a student needs, uh, you know, their data for grad school or a job, the information would funnel from this information, this direct information source only. Employ a transcript sharing service. So uh, transcripts are collected and shared amongst universities and colleges in a repository. So basically you get a unique code for your institution to be able to access the transcript. Uh, so it's very similar to the objective that we mentioned behind the direct transmission system for application for admission applications. Uh, again, we receive the transcript directly from the institution, which is really a key point. So if you don't employ this practice, um, at, or if you do maybe both, um, so whenever possible, insist on original documents, of course, being sent to your office. Be very wary of applicants handing you that sealed transcript. Um, because of course, you know, there's no foolproof method, method to ensure that the transcript hasn't been tampered with. Um, another point on this, become knowledgeable, right, on institutional nuances. So we talked about those handwritten transcripts. Know sort of who does that and keep a record of it. So this is my reference to strip mall schools. Um, so definitely be aware of this. Um, so it's a type of diploma mill uh, that we introduced. Uh, so strip mall schools are shell companies, uh, basically, and so they could have a storefront in Ontario. Uh, international students could use these businesses uh, to gain Canadian credentials for admission purposes, so there's no substance to the offering. Um, students could believe they are getting a degree. They're very lucrative businesses. They're hard to detect not regulated, and sort of once one is in fact shut down, another springs in its place, sort of like a, like a bad weed. Um, the next one is don't say cheese. So uh, something as simple as a student taking a photo, right, of their degree during convocation and posting on social media could be used to manufacture a fake degree. Uh, so this is sort of the $200 we heard earlier that you could, you could buy this replicated version. You could maybe lift someone's uh, degree from the internet. So uh, there are concerns that this is um, uh, rampant right now because of course a lot of us, have, we haven't had convocations with COVID and students really want to find you know, a way to celebrate their achievements. So they've been posting more, um, more photos. Review your grade process. Um, so compare your compare intern grades to final grades. So look for patterns, anomalies. Does anything deviate uh, drastically? 
investigate. So these are just good overall data integrity uh, uh, practices. Audit your systems. I love this quote. So when the fox is in the hen house, it's too late to worry about a fence. This is a, a, a quote from our records manager. So we all know that, you know, hacking into a system to change a grade has happened at some institutions. It's obviously splashed across the media. Um, so to ensure that you put good measures in place to uh, frequently audit your systems and, you know, employ the principle of uh, think like a hacker. Take stock of your transcript paper. Um, this is something that's very simple to do, I think, uh, if, if you don't do it. So transcripts can actually be sold on the black market for a lot of money. Uh, so take inventory of your paper, how much you ordered versus how much you used. Mark your transcripts with a unique serial number. So this can help you in investigating fraud cases and can also be used by the other institutions to spot a problem. So. Uh, so say we sent transcript number 001 something uh, dated yesterday, but here I have one today that's dated uh, 565 or something like that. Oh, that seems a bit odd. So that's a quick way uh, to, to spot something that's not right. So again, uh, along the same vein, learn how to, how to spot this bogus transcript. So bleached or color. Uh, scan trans transcripts are pretty easy to detect these days, but I say that with improvements in printer and design software, I'm thinking even Photoshop, right? Um, so this, this will get harder and harder, uh, and definitely conversations are taking place online about how to do that with different tools. Compare all transcripts against, against each other, so you spread them all across your desk, right? Um, so this is one way. Uh, fakes can be spotted when the final transcript has significant differences from a prior transcript. So this is a, a, a tip. It is fairly common for interim transcripts to be real, but the final to be doctored. So this can be hard to spot, but a good example is that uh, generally prior terms period should not change between the interim and final submissions. It happens, but, but it should be uh, relatively rare. Investigate whistleblower claims. So, of course, students often email about, you know, um, wrongdoings and, and different things like that. Do take the time to investigate these. Some of these are legitimate. Others, of course, are not. Uh, leverage your network. Um, this, the, the network is, is, a, is, a, is a great place to share these best, best practices. You could also work together to identify these, some suspicious activity and share that information. And also, you know, lobby for regulatory change. So we talked about these strip mall schools and this could be a way that we, that we could gain momentum for change. So in Canada, we have the uh, Association for Registers for the Canadian, or for the, the re, for so many acronyms these days, uh, Association for Registers of the Universities and Colleges of Canada. Of Canada. So that's one example of, uh, of a network. And then our final sort of recommendation, um, when I think about this one, and it sort of deviates from what we were talking about, I think of, I think of that movie, uh, Catch Me If You Can, um, that had uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks. And if you've seen this movie, uh, he, I guess he, he's a pilot and he fakes being a doctor um, with no credentials whatsoever, right? So we need, to, we need to be mindful of credentials. So when you're hiring, play, pay close attention to the following. So note sequential issues on your resume. So uh, list a master's degree, but is missing undergraduate or maybe the time for completion is off. So something to watch. Um, an individual, say, was working while they were studying. Mm, they should be in the same city, so that's something that you can check. Verify by calling the post-secondary institution. So don't be, don't be satisfied with a, a simple internet search. Uh, diploma mills have very sophisticated websites that look surprisingly authentic, right? So when you do search the internet, particularly for these strip mall schools, a few things to keep in mind um, is tuition calculated based on the degree versus the credit. 
it should be by the credit, right? If you see the degree, there's something fishy. What are the degree requirements, right, of the program? Um, and is the school well established or has it just mysteriously uh, appeared? So this is, uh, this is our top 13, thank you. Terrific. Thanks for that, Jamie. Um, and a topic that we didn't actually get to in today's webinar that might be worth talking about in your circles is an extension of this is examining and closely scrutinizing the credentials of those who are applying for academic jobs to ensure that they have the credentials that they actually say they have. There was a news article that came out about how a hundred, hundred full professors uh, in Nigeria were relieved of their academic positions because they didn't have the degrees uh, to get their academic uh, jobs in the first place. But that's a topic for a different webinar. This just about brings us to the close of our time together today. We hope this session has been useful to you in understanding how the world of university and college admissions fraud works and some things you can do to prevent it. We'd like to give a shout out to two of our colleagues, Dr. Saroosh Sabagan and Ismail Faisal, who will be offering a companion session to today's webinar in January as they zoom in on the issue of fraud in English language proficiency testing. Uh, we'll be there to listen to them and we hope that you join us for that. Jamie and I are conducting some research um, to better understand admissions fraud. So if you're interested in finding out more about that uh, survey and research, please get in touch with us. Um, and finally, if this is an interest uh, uh, for you and an area that you have some expertise on, we're going to be further developing this work through an edited book. So uh, we welcome questions about that. We've got our emails there on the screen. Uh, and it's time to move into our question and answer session. Uh, but before I do that, I also wanted to let you know that the slides for today's session are already available for you online to download. Uh, they're available from our University of Calgary digital repository, so you can get a copy of today's slides and the recording will also be sent out in a few days. So we can move into the Q&A portion of our webinar today, but we had a couple of questions that came in earlier. So I wanted to um, ask this one to you, Jamie. It came in from Crystal, and Crystal's asking about the higher national diploma from some countries. And she said she's experienced this degree in students who were told two uh, higher national degree uh, diplomas equaled a degree by the school and how disappointed they are. So I wondered if you'd heard about the higher national diploma from some countries and if you could comment on that. No, no, I actually haven't heard uh, about that, but this is great because there's always something new, right, in this, uh, in this landscape. So thank you. Thank you for that information. It's definitely something worth investigating. Okay, thanks for that one. I see some other questions coming in. But before, Marion had asked about the fake degrees that were being sold on Pinterest. So you've seen them on Pinterest and I've seen them on Pinterest. And Marion said, has anyone ever ordered one for their institution to see what they actually look like? Um, and I will tell you that I have considered it because of the research and work that I do. But I realized that if I did that, I might be violating my university's code of conduct um, because I might than be uh, engaging in unethical behavior. So I actually haven't gone that far yet because I'm trying to figure out the ethical complexity of ordering a degree that sort of looks like the one I've legitimately earned. I wanna see does, does the one I order online look like the one I actually uh, earned? Um, so I haven't done it yet, but if anybody's done that, we'd love to hear from you. Um, have you done that, Jamie, or has anybody at Carleton done that? No, no, for the same reasons, of course, that you mentioned. Yeah, it, uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem like an ethical thing to do. Um, and Adrian's asked a question. He said, the police monitor manufacturing fraud. You can't have a website that sells fake Gucci bags. Is there no policing of fake diploma sites? Um, it's an interesting question. And the book that I recommended earlier by Azel and Bear, um, Azel in particular is a former FBI agent. Uh, and they had uh, a large scale, um, what do you call it, like investigation in the United States some years back. Now that book is 15 years old now, but still fascinating, uh, fascinating read to see how the um, degree mill industry worked in the United States. And that's how they came up with this um, number of a billion dollar industry. Um, and they actually launched it uh, through the FBI in the United States and through in Canada. I think that that would be through the RCMP. And if there's work being done, then it's not being done publicly in the same way that Azelle and Bear published their book. They were published their book after they retired, to be fair. Um, but in terms of active investigations, I'm not actually aware of any in Canada.
Okay, a question comes in here from Josh at Assiniboine Community College and he's asking, do human resources professionals scrutinize credentials in the same way that admissions professionals do? It sounds like the school Sarah mentioned did it retroactively en masse. Um, I, I think this would be a great question for anybody with an HR background who's with us today. And I think that it really varies from one to another. And when I've talked anecdotally with some HR professionals, they tell me that often they believe uh, what is in a person's resume or posted on their LinkedIn uh, and don't always follow up. Um, and so that if there are fake degrees that are noted um, in companies, for example, that they might not find out until later. And for those who work in um, human resources in academic context, we have certain um, HR partners who work with academic staff and other HR partners who work with say management and professional or unionized staff. And I'm not actually sure of what the HR process is, uh, is here. I can say anecdotally that I've sat on a number of um, hiring committees and we get to look at an applicant's complete file. Um, but as a somebody who sits on a hiring committee, it's not up to us to check the credentials. I think it would be the HR partner and I don't know how that works in higher ed. Uh, if somebody else has insights, feel free to share them. Um, oh, okay, Kita. Um, I love this question from Kita because she's saying the processes are similar to Indigenous identity documentation issues. Have we noticed any crossover in the research? Um, I'll say no because our research has just begun. So we'll look forward to future collaborations uh, with those who know more about that in the future. Really, this is very nascent research. When Jamie and I went looking, we were very adamant that we wanted an evidence-informed session for you today. And we went digging up and we actually found a real lack of research on this. Um, there are some articles, there are a couple of books. We've read the books and gone through the articles um, and sort of talks high level about the industry and, and how it works. Uh, but we haven't actually seen much in terms of primary data. So that's what we're hoping to do with this survey is start some of that primary data. And for us, it falls under the issue of higher education ethics and institutional integrity. Um, so sometimes we talk about academic integrity, people think of student conduct, but certainly institutional integrity would be concerned with questions like this. Um, Jamie, did you wanna chime in at all on that? No, no, that's perfect, Sarah, absolutely. We're still, we're, we barely scratched the surface uh, of the research here, but we look forward to learning more. And I think the survey will really, I think it really, uh, it does differ. People are doing things so differently, which is what I've noticed. So even, a, you know, across Canada, so getting everybody kind of uh, figuring out what people are doing. And uh, so, yeah, happy to get the feedback, absolutely. Um, and as a question's come in, Jamie, I think that you and your team would probably have encountered this and said, you know, these are great workshops, but, um, you know, what are we doing? What are institutions doing to avoid this? And sometimes people in their works, and sometimes we all do, we get super busy, don't always have time to scrutinize every single transcript. Um, and uh, there's a lot of time pressures in processing admissions file. So, Jamie, what are, what are institutions doing? No, and I guess that that's sort of where I was going with the idea for like the evaluation service, right? Because, yeah, you know, it's busy. Um, and if, if, yeah, if you're if you're under pressure, a service may be the way to go and just staying on top of this whole like everything and all the different like we've only mentioned a few scams and things like that, like all of this stuff. Uh, sometimes going to a service that's sort of what they do and document may be the best course of action. Um, and question here from Karen. Again, you may know more about this, uh, Jamie, than I would. And uh, she's asking, are there particular countries or nationalities where degree fraud is more common? She said, I mentioned Nigeria. I mentioned one specific case, and I'll see if I can find the news article and pull it up. Uh, what about others? I'm always a little reluctant to single out um, particular countries uh, in terms of systemic um, misconduct. But, Jamie, you may have observed things in your practice. Did you want to comment? Uh, I'm the same. I wouldn't want to. I mean, it really, it happens everywhere. So I wouldn't want to shine a light, um, you know, on any country in particular. I think there's lots of cases. Obviously, you know, with international students, there does, there does seem to be more in that space overall, but uh, really it happens everywhere. I will share the news article that I saw from The Guardian about um, that was one um, 
case that was happening in a, in uh, in Nigeria. So I'll add that there. I always think, although that these are um, uh, you know, news stories. Sometimes I think that they provide an opportunity for further dialogue and building our awareness of how things operate. I will say that, that it's not limited to other countries. I recall seeing a news article from Canada about a nurse in uh, Quebec who had practiced for 20 years with fake credentials, and that was fairly recently. So it does happen in Canada for sure. Um, question that came in. Um, and Jamie, this might be for you. Are, are we aware of any WAEC verification methods that don't involve a uh, key uh, paid for by the student? It's been hard during lockdowns across regions in Africa to obtain these keys. Many need to, to be obtained in person by the student and only have five uses. So I wondered if you could talk about that. I, I don't know much about that question either. Actually, I, I'm familiar with the service, but I don't uh, about that particular case. Um, yeah, I don't I don't have further information about that. I think this just goes to show how little that we know on these broad topics. So if you have insights into some of these questions, um, we're happy to engage you through crowdsourcing some of the information. Um, and answers to these. Yeah, my, yeah. for me, it's like a, the lens that I'm applying here is a very uh, systems focus. So I, I want to support admissions uh, professionals. And if there's something that can be a centralized, a process or um, a, a policy or something like even across Canada that could be institute that would help everybody um, minimize these types of cases. So that's that's really what I'm narrowing. If, if there's something in that regard, uh, that's, the, that's the piece that interests me most. Yeah. And we had a question come in here from Fernanda and she's saying, um, how are the degrees from an interna international institution verified? And is there a place to look for degree sort of numbers or something like that? Jamie, what's your experience with that? Um, you can use, like I know, and, and because I don't do this directly, I know for our graduate, uh, our graduate programs, we do, we do use a service to vet that. Um, sorry, can you repeat the question again? Yeah, it was how, how, are, um, how are degrees from international institutions verified? Yeah, I know for, for, for graduate programs, we do use the service, but we, um, are, we have a sort of an international admissions team and they, um, they would actually uh, vet those themselves. Yeah. And I see there's some great questions coming in here that are particular to the UFC. Um, so I'll say don't work in the registrar's office. I do research on these topics. So I don't actually know if we're going to be doing things like having a cross campus wide evaluation service. I think it's a great question and things to kind of ask um, certainly uh, your associate deans and deans who can bring them forward to things like, um, you know, bigger meetings where those university wide initiatives can be talked about. But Jeff has a question here, a question for Jamie specifically. He says, Jamie, what's your experience with applicants who've been swindled unwittingly? They've been caught and they're scared. What advice do you give them in to avoid making their situation worse? Oh goodness, that is a that is a good question, right? Um, but if been caught, it would be. Uh, I mean, it would be probably our you know our our ombuds person and our student affairs um, a team that would work with the student. Um, and sorry, can you repeat that again, sir? Sure. And I'll say the question it was came a great in from question. The, yeah, it was from our ombud at the University of Calgary. Ah, so it's the ombud yeah. asking the question. Uh, he's like, what's your experience with applicants who've been swindled unwittingly? So they've been duped, right? And then they've been caught and now they're scared. Um, so what advice would you give them to not make the situation worse? I know our ombudsperson would have our ombuds would have the answer to this hands down, right? I'm I'm just the systems person, but uh, um, I think always just being um, uh, you know just being honest about their experience. I think that you know in general tends to to, to be the best course of action. Yeah, I think it can be really tricky in situations like this, right? Because I think there can be an assumption of deception. 
Um, mm -hmm. And we know that the differences between some of those, uh, you know, fake degrees where people know what they're buying. I mean, if you go on Pinterest to buy a degree, you know that what you're buying is fake, especially when the watermark across the screen says fake degrees. Um, but then there's other cases, and I've heard of them too, where students think that they're working with a legitimate agent or service and they've been duped into thinking that whatever they've paid for is actually substantive and and legitimate only to find out later that it's not right and um in, in the cases that happen in the united states when the students get these federal student loans they can rack up tens of thousands of dollars in debt uh, to go to school for a program that is not recognized by any, edu any educational institution or governing body. So I think that that as we're approaching these conversations with students, you know, as with academic integrity, that we try and first to figure out what happened rather than a, uh, starting with an assumption of guilt. Um, I mean, it, it, there may there may be an intentionality behind it and an intention to deceive, but not but not always. Uh, and I'm always a little bit um, I'm not a little bit, I'm very hesitant to start from a position of assuming guilt, uh, but rather to try and discover what happened and then uh, unpack it from there. So I can appreciate, Jeff, that some students would be in a really delicate position. We find that now, so contract cheating is uh, related, um, and that when students are being blackmailed by some of the contract cheating companies that um, they weren't anticipating it, and then they want to talk to somebody and they don't know who to turn to. So that's great. I'm just gonna look at some of the other uh, questions that are coming in here. Um, Oh, okay, so Marion's asking, do any institutions print credentials similar to how Canadian money's printed? This may assist with making credentials impossible to reproduce or counterfeit. I've had the same thought. Um, and I don't think at U of C we do, like with the Mylar, for example, and holograms. Um, and Jamie, you talked about the parchment paper and counting the parchment paper. So in your registrarial circles, has there been talk about using things like Mylar and holograms? Yeah, we're not. Yeah, definitely people are talking about it. We're not doing anything like that either. But yeah, that is that is very interesting. Um, and Helen asks, how are students being educated about admissions fraud? Um, well, I, I don't actually know. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, this might be one of the first webinars that's happened on the topic. We couldn't find a whole lot of evidence about it. And we think that there's a lot of um, uh, people don't know. It's just simply off people's radar, right? And certainly with, um, with some students, knowing how to check the legitimacy of a school is not necessarily something that they might be trained to do right they might go by school reputation so for example carlton and the university of calgary are reputable schools they have name brand recognition but i know for those who haven't been to university it can be a very daunting landscape and so i'll share an example to show just how confusing it can be for people who are unfamiliar with the higher education system i have a family member um, who hasn't been to university, so no one in their, their immediate family has been to university, but their kids wanted to go to university. And kids were getting ready to apply for university. And this family member called me one day in tears because she had all of these brochures and all of this literature that she was trying to read. And she said to me, she said, I just don't understand what's the difference between an undergraduate degree and a bachelor's degree. And she was so confused because she'd seen both of these terms in the literature from another reputable, what I consider it was one of the U15s, so a reputable Canadian university. But that's how confused she was to the point of like being frantic and in tears and had to call me. So I had to tell her that they're the same thing. But we get in higher education, we get so used to um, some of these terms and we take them for granted uh, that we may not remember that uh, there are lots and lots of people out there if they've never been to university how easy it is to be confused and to be duped um, by systems that they may not understand right particularly like in this case it was a parent trying to do the right thing for their kid and a member of my own family so i said feel free to call me about anything um, but uh, in terms of what we're doing to educate students Yes, there's a lot of work to do and I was talking with Helen about this um, before the webinar started. I think there's actually a tremendous opportunity to engage student government groups uh, in some of this work because the voices of students are very, very important in all of this work. So this is, we hope, is just a beginning. Um, okay, so, uh, okay, I'm just looking back through. Thank you, Josh, for sharing that news article. So Pat Chan saying, we mentioned that some people who do not have an undergrad qualification but have a legitimate graduate degree is a fake. Uh, it's not true as some senior students were accepted based on vast experience in the industry. So I wondered if you might comment on that because I think it relates to what you're talking about of looking at the, the degrees, Jamie. 
Sorry, can you repeat that again, Sarah? It was just sure. breaking up a bit on my end. Yeah, it said that um, we'd mentioned that some people who do not have an undergrad qualification but have mm -hmm. a legitimate graduate uh, is fake. Uh, it's not true because some senior students were accepted based on their vast experience in the industry. Oh, wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, because you can, you can buy at any level, right? They might just buy one particular qualification, say, yeah, not, not complete the undergraduate uh, degree, but uh, um, go right into a master's, for example. And uh, I think one of the things that's coming in here is recognition of prior learning and experience. Um, and there are systems in place to evaluate critically and thoroughly and rigorously um, how much uh, prior learning, prior experience can uh, be applied to, to a degree. Uh, and I think that there are official bodies and I know that there are official bodies in Canada that will, that will look at that. Um, and so Bev Ross made a comment that I thought I'd share with you, Jamie, and she said she's worked at a university that ha used special paper that if copied would show up a void message all over the page. So I thought I'd share that with you. Um, so yes, I think that's a, that's a good resource for anybody who works with transcripts. Um, and Sarah from Ontario has a question here as well. And she's asking if anyone's had experience, this might be for us and it might be for others who are here with us today, in academic integrity hearings where a student has a fraudulent transcript, thinking about trying to get transfer credits with that turns out to be a fraudulent degree. And how do we move forward with penalties or are there any recommendations? Well, um, I have never been involved in a hearing like that, but it wouldn't surprise me that such hearings exist. Um, I'm just trying to think. I, I think that that would actually go into as well non a form of non-academic misconduct, I think, because if I think about academic misconduct, I think it pertains to coursework and other things leading towards a student's degree after they've been admitted. But if they've applied with fraudulent credentials, then I'm not sure if that would kick, how that would actually come through. So I'm gonna to have to think about that one. That's a good question. Thanks. I don't know if you have any thoughts, Jamie, or anybody else. Yeah, I haven't been involved in that type of hearing either. Absolutely. Wow. Okay. This is amazing because uh, my brain is kind of whirling now with all of the um, other topics that we need to keep following up on as we engage in this research. Um, yeah. Interesting. Uh, we do have, again, it might fall back on institutional code of conduct because we do expect uh, people within our academic community to behave in certain ways, students, faculty, staff, uh, alumni, and that might be the only way to, to fall back on it uh, in terms of, um, people who have applied fraudulently, if they've made it through, if they've slipped through somehow. Um, and I, I'm not sure, I think we would be dealing with that on a case by case basis at our university. Jamie, would it be the same for you at Carleton? I, I would think so, yes. But I think it does speak to what you were talking about in needing a systems approach to some of this and procedures and policies and that, that kind of thing. Um, and I think in places like the UK, where they're a little bit more advanced mm -hmm. than us with contract cheating, um, and the large scale way that they address it over there. We always, we often look to the UK for what are they, what are they doing there? Um, and in terms of contract cheating, they're now looking at alumni who work for contract cheating companies who have been found to work for contract cheating companies and they're starting to have discussions about withdrawing their degrees. So that's a conversation that's happening across the pond. Uh, and I don't know where they're at with that conversation, but I did hear it uh, in a recent webinar from, uh, from over there. I'm like, okay, that's an interesting angle. We haven't looked at how we engage our alumni in these conversations either, but it might be something for us to bring up in another five or 10 years. Um, and then uh, we have a question here for international students might, it might impact their study permit if they applied with fraudulent um, credentials. Um, it might, it might, I don't know how, um, cause I don't know enough about the international study permit side of it, but you can start to see how all of these different aspects of admissions and uh, enrollment come into play, right? And we almost think of them as separate processes. There's admissions and that process ends. And then there's the um, uh, being a student uh, enrollment, and then there's graduation. And they're sort of seen as completely discrete process. And once somebody's <coughs> been admitted, we don't usually go back to their files after that, to the best of my knowledge, uh, once they're in the enrollment phase of their education. But I think the question that you've brought up here is a, an interesting one around um, what mechanisms 
could schools put in place to ensure that once the admissions process is closed, that it might not close forever. And if there's a need to go back and revisit those admissions credentials or alleged admissions credentials, that that's something that could be, could be done. Um, Jamie, what are your thoughts? No, yeah, exactly. You should be able to go back, it seems, right? Absolutely. And, and uh, it, it, it's similar, I guess, to academic in integrity cases where you do have all of these particular things on file. Uh, and a question I don't know the answer to, so somebody else knows, uh, feel free to put it in the chat box is, if uh, we're notified of a fraudulent admission from a student at a university, we find out that the credentials that they used to apply were fraudulent or faked, are we required to report this um, to the IRCC? My guess, um, I, I don't know for sure, but you know, we do offer training on our campus here. The Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Office on campus has offered us workshops on what information we can share during an academic misconduct um, case, for example. Uh, and there are processes in place to protect students' privacy and the privacy of others involved. Um, and I can't say for sure, but my guess from that would be we might not report the student because it might be a violation of their privacy is my guess, but I'm not sure entirely. Um, but I'm not sure that we're in the business of reporting students to government officials. But if somebody else has different um, experience, then yeah, feel free to chime in. Okay, we've got Michael Corbett here. Um, hello, oh, sorry, Michelle Corbett. Um, and she has a question for Jamie. Jamie, is there a system in place for higher education institutions in Canada to alert or share information with one another regarding fraudulent companies or unregulated agencies that they've come across in the application process? For example, she's curious if a student submits a fraudulent document to Carleton for admissions, would Carleton alert other institutions in Ontario or elsewhere um, to look out for the student record of concern. Uh, and she recognizes, of course, there's also privacy concerns. So yeah, what's your take on that? Yeah, and somebody has just posted, and this is what this is exactly up my alley, right? What I'm interested in is how we share that information. And somebody had just posted, you're right, there is very much an informal uh, network, but I think I don't know if that's sufficient. Um, you know, I see, I, I think we do need to, to have a mechanism to track this in a better way. Uh, you know, it's a global, it's a global problem, right? It's, we, we may have our, our groups within Canada and what have you, but I think that, I think that this is one area that could be done better. Yeah, and as I was reflecting back on the book that I was um, reading by is Ellen Bear, and they talked about, you know, there's no blacklists for uh, universities because, or colleges, because they can change so frequently. Um, and then there can also be uh, universities that are in the early stages of development. So they're seeking accreditation, but they may not have it yet. So if they're blacklisted, um, and then uh, later they get their accreditation, apparently at one point in time, I don't know if it's still the case, the United Nations maintained a list of all of the higher education institutes uh, in the world, but the problem was that the bogus ones could also register because it was just a website form to, to fill out. Um, so there wasn't really quality control, which is kind of where I think that some of the conversations going and quality assurance in higher education in Canada is provincially regulated rather than federally regulated. Whereas in the UK, they have the quality assurance agency uh, in Australia, they have the um, tertiary education standards uh, quality agency. So in other places where I think there's national bodies that oversee and govern quality assurance, they can take a more systematic uh, and unified approach. Whereas here, at best, I think we would have provincial approaches. Okay, Crystal's asking us about the criminal aspects here. And she's saying, um, if the criminal aspect's too broad, who then who would pursue? Is it worth the time slash cost if it happens so randomly, as we don't know? Well, in the um, in Azelle and Bear's book, that's one of the things that they pointed to is that law enforcement agencies have limited resources. Uh, and so in their case, there was 
uh, pushed to conduct a federal investigation there, and they were able to do the work for a period of time, and then and then after they retired, published their book. Um, but it's some for some people, it's considered a white collar crime or um, you know a low level crime compared with some of the really more pressing issues that law enforcement has to deal with. So uh, in terms of who would pursue here, I think it, I, don't, I don't think it would be local police. I think it would probably be RCMP, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, seeing if there's other questions that come in. Um, okay, so uh, Michelle Cousins is asking everyone, uh, Jamie as well, uh, does anyone have any tips for verifying high school credentials from China? Uh, other than using the C-H-E-S-S-I-C uh, or W-E-S. So any tips there, Jamie? Oh, goodness. Well, I know that I know that uh, our admission folks, similar, they, they do have some uh, networks, right, and people that, uh, and I think they sort of know who, who does what, like, with respect to, because there is a lot of, I had talked a, a little bit about the handwritten transcripts and different things like that, and the fact that stuff really varies, um, uh, you know, for different departments within the same institution at some, in, in, at some of these post-secondary institutions, so I think that they sort of know that, like, they, they have built up that expertise, and then they have those connections that they get but it is very, um, you know, it's not systematic in the sense it's 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 calling or emailing at something like that. It's not it's not tracked uh, per se. So I think that that's what our team does. Jamie, I had a question for you as well. Um, to what extent are the processes around credential verification? Like we've had lots of questions today about how does this happen or how does that happen? Sort of, it seems a bit mysterious, right? So I'm an academic and I've sat on admissions. Um, committees before, but I really don't know what happens with the student files before I get them. Um, and is that process itself something that is um, like kept opaque on purpose or is it just that uh, like people get really busy and they're just doing their jobs? Like is would there be something um, that bad could happen if universities made their processes clearer? Um, you, you, you mean like sharing what their particular process is, Sarah, or? Yeah, so in terms of like, uh, when I get an admissions file, for example, um, and then we assume that our office staff has gone through the preliminary mm -hmm. um, steps to identify anything that, you know, shouldn't make it through to us. And they do, they do an excellent job, really. Yeah. Um, we're not supposed to get incomplete files, for example. We're supposed to mm -hmm. have files where there's all the reference letters, there's all the transcripts. If the IELTS or TOEFL score is needed, then that's in there as well. So that by the time it comes to me, um, say as an academic who's looking at graduate student admission files, that I've got everything I need. And there's sort of been a weeding out process mm -hmm. of uh, incomplete files. And I think as well, there's also a process Process to identify um, mm -hmm. any questionable paperwork that's in there at that point. But the process behind the scenes is something right. that, it's yeah, something that we shared. don't really know about. Yeah. Yeah. So is, yeah. is there anything that was there was mis wrong with that? No, I don't, I don't think it's a, uh, um, I think within your own, you know, your in your own school, uh, you could definitely probably share that practice just so you obviously feel confident in, in, in the package that's before you, right? And you know what, what steps have, uh, have been taken. That's terrific. Yeah. And like I said, I know that our office staff spends a great deal of time ensuring that, uh, by the time the admissions applications come to us, that they're, um, that they're clear. I have to tell you, I laughed when you said, take all the transcripts and spread them out on your desk because um, at the U of C, everything's done electronically. So the year that uh, one year that I was looking over admissions files, I was doing it on the weekend. I had, um, you know, 51 files for our doctoral program and our specialization to look over. And I had like from Thursday afternoon until Monday morning, there was no printing. I would have been printing thousands of pieces of paper. I was going through them all um, online in, in PDF format. So there was no uh, spreading anything out on my, on my desktop. Yes, uh, this way through a couple of screens, but um, on a table. And I thought that might have actually been a good way to visually see it all together because I tend to go through one file, look at the next file. I go through them in sequence and don't look at them as a group. Yeah, I guess that would be easier to do pre-COVID, right? Now we're, we're, we're stuck with all of this, uh, our, our digital stuff. But yeah, sometimes trickier cases, just actually looking at uh, the, the, the paper can help, right? You can see it visually better. 
Yeah, for sure. And I wanted to give a shout out to, Be uh, to Bev. Thank you so much for digging into our university calendar to talk about uh, credential rec rescission. So that was a really helpful link. Thank you. I'm going to look that up myself um, after this session. Terrific. Well, um, we'll give an opportunity here for any other questions in the final few minutes that come in. Uh, and I wanted to offer, um, Jamie, if you had any final reflections from today. Uh, thank you, everybody, for all the great questions. I think that this actually, this gives us a lot of things to continue to think about. I think that Sarah and I just, you know, we've just kind of started this, but there's so many interesting seeds and things that people have mentioned to, to go back in. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the same. I'm kind of thinking of different things that could potentially be connected now. So this was, thank you very much. The feedback has been very valuable. And, uh, you know, we definitely hope that people fill out our survey because we want to, we want to hear this information. So then we can, we can really, you know, get in there and, and, and see what those gaps are and try to minimize, right? this behavior from happening. Thanks, Jamie. I've put my email address in the chat box, so feel free to do the same. You can reach out to us. Uh, friends, that's just about our time for today. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and remember to sign up for next month's webinar as well. So I'll put the link there to do that. And that's going to be with Dr. Cecilia Parther from St. John's University in the United States talking about equity, diversity, and inclusion as they relate to academic integrity. Uh, and like I said, we'll be there and we'd love to have you join us. So that wraps us up for today. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you next month. Bye for now.